attend and said, this is the second prostate cancer meeting. We'd over 100 last time and we're heading that way again, which I think undermines the significance of uh, what we're talking about. What we'll do, we'll go to Professor Tim Briggs to begin with. He's going to say a few things about cancer then. I'll, I'll just introduce our running order and our speakers. So, Tim, did you want to sort of lead off? Yeah, so thanks, um, John, and uh, many thanks to everybody coming to this meeting, which I think is going to be really important. As people know, I, I run the GERF program and also the National Director of Clinical Improvement Elective Recovery, but have been asked involved in the cancer and deli operational delivery of the, the cancer pathways, in part because I'm a cancer surgeon doing sarcoma of bone and soft tissue. And what we've done is we've d divvied up the data in terms of the alliances across the four common cancers, the ones we want to work through. Clearly, one is prostate, then there's skin, colorectal, and the one coming up on the rails is gynae. And when you break down the data by um, alliance, of which there are 21, soon to be 20, and you look at individual trusts within each alliance, what's really interesting is within each alliance, there are trusts doing each pathway or part of that pathway really well. So we're going to have meetings with all the alliances, starting with the skin pathway, to absolutely standardise that in a way that patients will get better outcomes. Speaking to John and, and Kieran, clearly we felt that the it was important to refresh the prostate pathway, and this is what is being discussed there. And I'd like to thank Caroline for her leadership and input into this, because again, I think this is also going to allow us to really change the way we do things in the best interest of patients. So I'll stop there, John. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Tim. So uh, th thank you for the introduction. And what we're going to do, we'll run through the programme. Caroline is going to update best practice pathway for prostate. Uh, Satish Madanini is going to talk about straight to test. We were asked to cover that at the last meeting. And John Aiming is with us and we'll talk about PET-CT. But Caroline, I think we'll hand over to you and just get going with the clinical pathway and uh, you'll share that final version with us. Great. Um, no, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Good to see you all. Just looking to share and it needs me to allow recording. So I'm presuming somebody is doing the recording. Um, Here it is, Caroline Throton. Can you see or hear? She's her? just rejoining. <laughs> Sorry, <Okay. about> <laughs> it's uh, yeah, uh, major IT fell there. So sorry. Um, Grant, I'm hoping you can all see these slides. That that's coming through now. You're perfect. Okay. Thanks, Caroline. Even in even in Devon. So uh, the the idea behind this was really to look at how, as Tim said, we could refresh the pathway. So not necessarily changing the main items that have been in previous recommendations, but looking at the um, smaller things that go around those um, those main items that uh, would really help us to deliver on the, on the pathway. You've had these slides, obviously not everybody will have had a chance to, to look at them, but you've got them there. And the, it's in two sections. So the things that happen before a biopsy decision and the things that happen afterwards. And rather than point my cursor around the two slides over a long period of time, I've divided them um, into their smaller sections. So primary care recommendations, no need for a second PSA, no need for a digital rectal examination if the PSA is abnormal. We do still need a urine test to exclude a urinary tract infection, but that can be a dipstick or it can be a sample to the lab, depending on, on local practice. And there was much discussion about the thresholds. Should we use a different threshold? And we've agreed that there's no recommendation to change that, but we recognise that some people are using age-related PSA for men with symptoms, and some aren't. Some are using the single threshold 
specified in the prostate cancer risk management um, of three, but some are only doing that for men with no lower urinary tract symptoms. In terms of triaging, when we get them in primary care, if they've been referred with an abnormal digital rectal examination, but the PSA is normal, then we recommend that men are reviewed in clinic to repeat that DRE. We know it's not um, a strong recommendation as a raised PSA, so they don't need to go straight to test. And we've also heard that some trusts are finding that men are getting referred in on that pathway by that mechanism when really their problem is urinary symptoms and it's um, appropriate to transfer them to a urinary symptoms pathway if, um, if, if that's appropriate after examination and to take them off the more rapid cancer pathway. If men are fit for radical treatment, then we recommend straight to MRI and there's going to be an, a, another whole um, presentation about that. They don't need a DRE if they're having an MRI. If they're not fit for radical treatment or they might not be fit for radical treatment, you can opt for a clinic review first. The recommendations, the guidelines have been to do an MRI for a prize of biopsy, but there hasn't been so much on what you should do with that MRI result. So we've clarified that. If it's a PIRADS 1 or 2, man doesn't need to have a biopsy and can be discharged to the GP. We've also noted that there can be a problem where people are either coming back with minimal PSA changes. So we've made some recommendations on what we would do um, when they'd be suitable for another MRI based on a PSA rise. Equivocal MRIs will be stratified by a high PSA density or not. If the PSA density is low, they can be discharged, the same as for the low-risk MRIs. If the PSA density is high, then you can have a discussion about biopsy. So biopsy should be offered to all those men with a lesion with a high suspicion of cancer, so a PIRAD 4 or 5, and discussed and offered to those men with a high, with a, a, an equivocal scan, but a high PSA density. Then we looked at how that biopsy should be done, because again, recommendation to biopsy has a lot of resource implications and how the um, biopsy is, is done in terms of the patient and the setting and also how many cores are taken makes a lot of um, impact on, on resources. So a clear recommendation not to use routine transperineal mapping. Um, maximum of 12 to 14 cores should be sufficient and you should plan the biopsy strategy depending on what's suitable for the patient in terms of treatment. So if they've got a huge lesion, clearly going to need um, multimodality treatment or radical treatment, you could just sample that. If they've got a small lesion and some non-visible Gleason 3 plus 4 on the other side would influence what you offer them, then also sample that side. And then what to do after you've done the biopsy. So we've had a sort of controversy for a number of years where we have to urgently ask men to make a decision to do nothing or do something, even though doing nothing is one of the options. So we've clarified this of where surveillance is appropriate, then they can be taken off the um, urgent pathway and you can record the fast diagnosis standard so that they're not forced or um, uh, encouraged into a rapid decision when there's no clinical need for that. But where active surveillance isn't a management option, then they should still be getting timely review, consideration of active treatment and starting hormone treatment in those men who are having radiotherapy and it will be part of their standard of care. Again, a, a, a delivery issue in those biopsy results negative for cancer. We find that some of these men are remain in clinic for a long time and um, so we've clarified that so where there's a low risk of a missed cancer then they can be discharged so that's with an equivocal MRI and calculate the PSA at which they can come back if there is a moderate or concern about a missed cancer then it needs to be discussed in the euro radiology meeting so if you've got an MRI score in four or five the urologist and the radiologist need to consider whether the person missed the target when they were um, uh, throwing the needle, as it were, or whether it could be explained by acute inflammation 
And depending on that discussion, you might recommend rebiopsy if it's a concern about a missed large target or repeat MRI at six to 12 months. Staging needed for those with um, higher risk cancers and bone scan and CT of the chest, abdomen and pelvis is a default, but we know that there's a growing availability of PSMA PET and managing that demand can be difficult. So we've set out the priorities for PET scanning, but with a note to not allow excessive weight for PET scan uh, to delay things if you can get the answers sooner. And then these are this is the, the pathway summarised in those two slides. And I'm happy to have any uh, any questions now or, or later. Thanks very much. Um, can I just check if people can hear me OK? Because it's glitching a little bit of my end. Yeah, great. So, Caroline, I think that's a fantastic pathway and really practical. Magic, I know is it's dealt with quite a lot of the issues that, that clinicians and clinical teams and service managers talk to us about as we run the region and then follow up protocols. And I think this has is, is greatly simplified it. I'm just going to throw it open to the room, if I may, just so we get some comments back. So has anyone got any John, questions John, or comments? John, there, um, there are a couple of comments in the in the bar, so perhaps we could start with those. Um, Caroline. Pirates three within in black men or patients with a family history. So that's a really good question. There isn't any data saying that men are more at risk despite the MRI findings. It is an area where we need research, but for the moment they should still be um, stratified by a high PSA density. Um, offered a biopsy if they've got a high PSA density. If they're very keen on a biopsy, but many men aren't, <laughs> they could have it, but essentially still stratified by um, PSA density. Uh, next comment is from Sonia uh, Ashraf uh, saying, I thought it was essential to have a DRE result, even with a positive PSA, in order to request a multiparametric MRI since equivocal MRI results are stratified depending on DRE result. We're really moving away from that, I sense. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for that comment. I think it's really good to, to bring it up, but um, the evidence is clear and becoming clearer that DRE doesn't add to MRI and that it's therefore an unnecessary, potentially invasive, you know, mildly invasive test and um, it can slow down the pathway and can... Uh, put some men off coming forward at all. So I think we can be really clear that if somebody's having an MRI, they don't need to have a DRE because we don't stratify MRI results by DRE, but by PSA density. Okay. Uh, pirates are a Likert. Ha <laughs> So um, uh, for Tim, who might not be so embroiled in prostate MR politics, PIRADS is the international committee, which I am actually um, on, one of two UK people, two urologists. Likert is the um, sliding scale where expertise is taken into account. The UK standards are, uh, are that we can use Likert because it incorporates urologist expertise. So there's no particular driver to change. If you're using Likert, that's fine. If you're using Pyrads, that's fine. Okay. An explicit statement about EGFR up front from the general practitioner in terms of referral, so understanding that these patients will be getting contrast. Or yeah, thank you. That is a good, um, a, a good point. So some trusts are offering biparametric MRI. There's due to be... Um, a research study showing whether we can safely do that or whether we should use contrast. I think it is very helpful to have the EGFR from the GP because it does allow people to go straight to test where they're using that. So I think we should certainly make a note to add that into the um, into the referral. Okay. Now, we haven't been explicit about um, non-contrast bioparametric MRI. Would you like to just say a few words about that? Because the evidence base is clearly evolving. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think there's a lot of value in contrast, but obviously it makes it um, 
a more complex test, you need a doctor on site in case of an allergic reaction. There is a randomised study that's due to be presented at the European meeting in April in this exact setting. So ordinary referrals, PSA or, or DRE um, prompting assessment. And I think that will give us a steer on what is essential or not essential. If it comes out that biparametric is as good at detecting cancer, some trusts may decide they have other reasons to include contrast, but they'll be less imperative to do that. So at the moment, there's, there's no, you can do either without too much criticism. Okay. I think it's fair to say that we see this as an evolving document as well. And, and for Tim's benefit, would you just reprise the argument in relation to the cut, the current NICE cutoff, and potentially the move towards a PSA cutoff of three for patients between the ages of 50 and 75, 80? Yeah, so the um, this was probably the um, most contentious of all our discussions at the, at the expert group. Um, so the rationale for using a PSA of three and not needing higher PSAs with older men with larger prostates is that some work has identified that there's a, an equity gap where those older men are disadvantaged by needing to meet the higher criteria. So some places, uh, include, so us at UCLH, we use um, a PSA of three and anybody over a PSA of three gets an MRI. There is some concern that that will have resource implications where many more men will be coming onto the pathway and scanned. So after really quite heated debates on, on both sides, it was agreed that we would go to NICE and ask them to do a formal evidence review and that we can uh, proceed from there. I, I, I should say, so the rapid pathway um, in, in London has looked at this specifically and found out that it, there is a there is a gap where some men would miss out on a prostate cancer diagnosis that where they need treatment. So, but we'll see what the um, uh, the evidence review shows. Okay, thanks, Caroline. John, I think that covers the bulk of the issues raised in the chat, though. I think yeah. probably just I might just answer Peter Cook. It looks like CT and bone scan for all, or just right. the um, Cambridge Prognostic Group Three. Yes, absolutely. We don't want to be overstaging our low risk men, so it's just the um, four plus threes or Cambridge Prognostic Group Three onwards. And Carla, maybe the other thing uh, Ashley has just put in there, the evidence based interventions program, the EBI program, which is the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. Uh, a group of us have written some guidance around the PSA and the over 80s. Um, there was good evidence actually do harm rather than deny patients further treatment or investigation and Prostate UK and patient support groups were aligned with that as well. So it just gives you a little bit more um, evidence guidance around not over testing in the elderly age group. Carolyn, before we move on, just a couple of MRI questions there. There's, who, who is going to quality assure MRI reporting, looking at your own data? Uh, yeah, so essentially um, looking at it in your individual hospital, so seeing whether your um, looking at your MRI results, stratifying them by MRI score, and then looking at your biopsy results. And for those that can, going back to look at the negative biopsies, if you've got, you know, five-year data or you can identify who you had to see if they came back, that's really helpful. Um, and there are often networks of hospitals. So certainly in London, we have a, a, a prostate MR network where we look at assurance issues. And um, worth remembering that even if you think you've got it, great machines degrade over time and staff changes so it's a it's a quality assurance program that needs to be ongoing great thanks Caroline. and i think we'll just bring in sonia ashraf's comment or question as well as straight to mri is thought to be risky does it need nurse triage um again the guidance offers some uh, practical advice there caroline your thoughts yeah, yeah, thank you. So I think from the GP point of view, you're referring to the hospital. There is a triage at the hospital, but that doesn't need to be an appointment with the clinician in person. So at UCLH, that's run by um, uh, some of the admin staff. So you do need to ask people whether they are 
eligible for an MRI? Do they have a pacemaker, an implantable defibrillator? Those things, and that's on the responsibility of the hospital who's requesting the MRI. And then a kind of a sense check in terms of age, et cetera. So from the, I'm not sure, Sonia, sorry, whether you're a, a GP or, or in the um, secondary care, but the GPs would still be just referring urgent suspected cancer. And it's the pathway from the hospital end where you would if you get a 95 year old referred straight for mri you put them out and put them into clinic instead son you've put your camera on did you want to come back on that or does that answer the the question right no that's brilliant because um so what you're saying is it doesn't have to be a clinician doing the hospital triage it can be an administrator just following an algorithm and you can go straight to MRI without clinical triage is what you're saying. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So you do, you do what you would normally do, as in you would set up your um, what's usual. And then if the admin people spot somebody who doesn't tick yes on all the boxes, they've got, you know, name clinician or a person they know to go to for clinical advice on it. But basically it can be admin triaged. The other thing that they need to, the admin team need to ask is about um, uh, blood thinners just to see whether they're, um, you know, if they're going to a whole rapid pathway of, of two weeks. But if they're getting their MRI result from a clinician first, they don't need to do that. And may I just ask a second question on primary care, uh, being a GP? Um, I really like the minimum set criteria that a lot of these best practice time pathways have to really improve the quality of cancer sure. referrals coming in. If they're not met, and especially if a patient's going straight to MRI without clinical triage and with non-clinical triage, does does that warrant ICB sending it back to the GP to put in the compulsory information? Because we are now, you know, we are changing pathways going straight to test. Yeah, so in terms of minimal information, uh, uh, it is worth us specifying that in the, in, in the document. Um, you're quite right. And then at our centre, you know, admin staff will go will go back to the GP if this isn't if this or that isn't there and ask for it. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. No, we can always rely on, on Jake to come in with one. But just before I put Jake's question to Caroline, what I'd like the group to think about before we're moving on is there anything we've missed? So while we, we go to Jake, if the things you think we've missed, put them in the chat box or pop your hand up. So Caroline, Jake Patterson is trust dead. Okay, so truss is the transrectal ultrasound that you see the prostate on when you're doing the biopsy. Um, the most it means trust, thing, trust rectal biopsy. Yeah, exactly. I yeah, yeah. transrectal. Some call it transfecal biopsy. Sorry, yeah. I'm just going to take my provocative hat off. Um, the most important thing for cancer detection is to do a good MRI beforehand. So if you're, you know, delivering a really efficient trust biopsy service with MR targeting, then that's okay, but it is a little old fashioned and for reasons of um, infection control, it makes sense to move over to uh, transperineal for reasons of cost, it makes sense to make that local anaesthetic. Great, thanks, Caroline. And, and if you're sort of struggling with financial disincentives of moving something into an piece and setting, please let Kieran or um, Neil or I know because we will try and work around that where there's sort of perverse incentives to keep something in an operating theatre as a day case procedure. So just before, we're going to get some thoughts from Satish Madanini in a moment on straight to test. Before we do that, um, any burning questions for Caroline? We will have a wrap up at the end if you don't uh, have them right to hand just now. I did just notice one on. question in the chat about PSA density based referral over PSA doubling time and absolutely yeah. use a PSA density based re referral mm -hmm. threshold. Don't be waiting for the PSA to double because if it's eight and you've got to get to 16, that's quite a lot potentially. So, yeah, PSA density based. Thanks, Carolina. For some years end of things, primary care, we're really keen that we set a cutoff for re referral based on prostate volume and a frequency of testing. So, hopefully, that helps with a patient's discharge after a negative MRI, really clear guidance on when to come back. So, um, okay. Caroline, thank you. There may be more questions as, as we go on. Um, I'd like to go to, to Satish Madanini. 
consultant neurological surgeon at Northern Care Alliance. And Satish has spoken to us before about straight tests and MRI uh, and lessons learned. Satish, we'd be happy to share your thoughts with the group. I think you're on mute at the moment, Satish. Can't, can anyone else hear Satish? No. No. It might be a problem with your microphone. Um, so, Tish, if you want to uh, rejoin or sort that out, maybe if we're not feeling John aiming too much on the spot, we'll change the running order just while you have a look at the microphone. Is that all right? Yeah, I think Satish dropped off. John, on fair of us, but would you be comfortable we come to you just to have your thoughts on? The topic of PSMA PET, John's consultant neurological surgeon, uh, North Bristol Trust at the Bristol Urology Institute. Um, John, uh, we asked him to say something about PSMA PET because this came up last time. Who gets it? It's generally speaking, it's still rationed around England. So, John, uh, your wisdom on that topic, if you would. Yeah, well, look, hello, everybody. Um, what I think I'll do is, in the interest of time, just give some brief thoughts and then open it up to discussion. But in, in summary, you'll all be aware that staging of prostate cancer is important in order to classify patients and also risk stratify treatments. The bottom line is that PSMA PET has come to the front. It's actually been in the research environment for about 20 years, but over the last two years, it's all we've heard about. All the evidence we have to date in prostate cancer studies is based on CT and bone scan. It's not based on PSMA PET. I think that's the most important thing to stress. So if you look at current guidelines or look at EAU guidelines, the recommendation is that, yes, you can use these new modalities, including an MRI whole body, but be cautious in the risk in the fact that it can lead to potential changes in approach to the patients. And the risk of that is not treating patients appropriately or under treatment. So my, my feelings are that, yes, it's a great modality. It has a role potentially in the high-risk patient. We're still grappling with where that should be, but CPG5 would seem to be reasonable or high-risk stampede criteria, and I'm happy to come back to that. But otherwise, I think that the national picture is that access to PET is difficult. And in terms of timely access to PET, uh, most regions struggle with rationing and isotope availability. And therefore, I don't think it's something that can be standardised within a document at this moment in time. Is that a good summary to start us off? Yes, thanks, John. I think that's exactly it. Who do you offer a PSMA PET to and how do you prevent under treatment by restaging them? Uh, and then the rationing, there's no doubt everyone's limited. It's very odd to have a test where you're asked to only use it four times a month. We're not used to that, really. Um, what I might do, Car Caroline, this came up in the GERFT Academy group and was debated. Did you want to just sort of kick off and respond to John? Anything you would add to that or... Um, in terms of guidance for those on the call. You're just on mute, Caroline. Sorry. Um, yeah, completely agree. Much of the evidence is for uh, staging and, and further trials, etc., is based on the CT and a bone scan. So if that's what you've got, that's fine. And PSMA PET is a good modality, but there are availability problems. So we have set out some guidelines for prioritisation. And in fact, in, in London, we've sort of in our uh, cancer network, we've set out here's what we'll use it for now. And here's what we'll use it for when we've got better availability. We hope that'll be coming along. But um, it's a state of um, change at the moment. And as we know, there can also be acute shortages in, in PET um uh, PET scanning capacity. So being able to ensure we don't delay these high risk patients is really important. Thanks, Caroline. And of course, with 
back to, to Kieran's point earlier, this will be a live document. So if evidence changes a trial's report, then we, we can update that. Um, uh, outside of that, I think following those pragmatic guidelines. Let's just um, bring some others in. Vivek Kumar, Norfolk and Norwich. Vivek, did you want to comment on that? You've typed in the chat box, so I'm, uh, I spotted you. Hi, 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 John. Hi, Vivek. Can you hear me? Yeah, Vivek. perfectly well. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, with the rationing issues and availability of gallium-68, we had been using F18 uh, PSMA, and it has thrown us a lot of this false positive bone full bone positivity, and then we had to go back and do repeat with gallium or choline PET and things. Just your thoughts on uh, the data about it? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I have to agree. F18 can be a bit of a problem. So um, I'm not sure of what the um, which hospitals have got which available and, and, and when that changes. But I agree we um, try to use gallium because um, uh, it does seem to be significantly better. Yeah, our request is can we not, you know, put resources into getting gallium and then get away with F18. If the guidance comes nationally, it will be a lot beneficial. And we are having struggle with the star, you know, with the with the trust in getting rid of F18. So, so Vivek, I, I would just comment. I mean, I haven't shown any slides just because of the brevity of the meeting, but we've, we've done a pretty substantial audit of F18 in Bristol. And actually, right. we didn't have much equivocal finding within our patient group. We used it in the Stampede criteria, so PSA of 40, N1, super advanced disease, Gleason 9. But it, it, it does, I think what I was alluding to earlier, and I think what we're finding with this is that you have to know your own outcomes and then also be constantly re-evaluating them. And we're still in that space with PSMA PET. And in terms of the uh, criteria used to assess the scans, I think there's still work to be done. Yeah, I think that the, my, my point, question is that instead of each local region getting evidence for it, if you have a national guidance saying that F18 is inferior to gallium-68, we should concentrate our thoughts on gallium-68. And if I have a national document to say that, I can go and persuade my trust. That's my point. And I've seen it randomly, but my radiologists don't audit their own results. Yeah, I think that's really uh, that's a really helpful comment. And uh, Gary Cook is our professor of pet imaging on the um, on the committee, so I'm going to take that back to him directly and see um, if if he can comment on that. And and John, just to comment in in our practice, we actually use the PSMA PET in the lower risk than Stampede. So we're looking to see, are they suitable? So if they're sort of stampede suitable, really high risk, they wouldn't be first priority for the pets because we know that they've got a lot of disease. So we use ours at the um, at that interface of, should they be having radical treatments or is the sort of nodes that haven't shown up elsewhere? Thanks, Thanks Caroline. Caroline. So I think, I think we'll bring that uh, section just to close it's a fairly niche area at the moment and we'll keep informing us as the evidence comes through and can revise the guidance as needed uh, but i think that's helpful just to give us a steer in terms of what we do in the interim we're going to go back up to the northwest to satish and see if we sorted out the comms issue satish how are you doing hi john i don't know if you can hear me this time yeah brilliant you can brilliant. so the, uh, the internet we're very five... interested in your views on the straight to test. Lovely. Thank you, John. Um, I'm afraid 5G hasn't quite reached the northwest yet, so uh, hence the delay. So my apologies for that. Um, now, I'm going to try, and I'm a real IT whiz, not, but I'm going to try and share my screen. I've just got some slides that I thought might be useful to kind of run through the straight to test, like in a Manchester experience. So just let me know if this works. Hopefully it yeah. will. Okay, have you got, uh, is there something turned up yeah, there? Thanks, Satish, it's coming through. Yeah, Fab. Lovely. Okay, so I've got a bucket load of slides, but I won't go through all of them at all. I'm just uh, bearing in mind the brevity of the meeting. But So I'm Satish Madnani, I'm your all just up in, uh, up in Manchester, and I just thought it'd be useful, having been asked by Kieran, to kind of go through the, the kind of Manchester system-wide change in terms of straight-to-test 
And a lot of this has all come from the Vanguard work back in 2015, which was commissioned by NHS England. Carolyn there was part of that group. And the prostate pathway was kind of aligned to UCL, um, Marsden and the Manchester Cancer Alliance. And after two or three years of various discussions, we ended up with the um, best timed pathway. So from 2018, this was what was recommended by NHS England. And the core feature for this and, and the relevance of this was it very much recommended whether it was a 14, 21 or 28 day pathway, the straight to test. And the straight to test was very much about the MPMRI, which was still um, in various stages of evolution through the, uh, through the country at that point. So how did that affect Manchester? Well, Manchester is a cancer network of just over 3 million people. Um, in GM, we get approximately 9,000 two-week waits per annum, um, urology that is, and about 60% of those are for prostate cancer. So about 5,500 two-week wait referrals for prostate cancer per, per year. And when we talked about bringing in MRI, adding MR to the pathway, we found that there were already significant variations within the partners within Manchester itself. At that time, I know you've touched upon this already, Carolyn, transrectal or transfecal biopsy was very much the standard of care back in 2019, 2020. MR was being used, but it was being used in a non-standardised fashion, quite often in a slightly inappropriate fashion, and many institutions were already struggling to meet the uh, the 31 and 62 day pathway. So the addition of straight to test at that point felt like it was just not manageable. Um, so historically in GM and in most of the country, I suspect, it was very much GP referrals, patients reviewed in clinic, transrectal biopsy, patients come back and then you work through the, uh, the histology results. And that was all to be done in 62 days. But what we found at this point in time in 2019 um, and 2020 was that there was significant variation across the patch. So patients were having a second PSA after being seen in clinic. They were having a second PSA referral up. They were having a, a prostate biopsy, sometimes then having their MR afterwards, having an MR after SMDT and an MR before transrectal, uh, trans uh, perineal biopsy. So a lot of variation. And even at that stage, the compliance for the 62-day pathway across GM was very variable between 80 and 90%, so still not perfect. So now this is a really busy slide and I'll, I'll skip through this very quickly because I'll move on to the bits that I think are kind of relevant moving forward. But the, G, the straight to test pathway, so all patients referred in as two-week waits underwent daily triage. Well, we've touched upon this, that daily triage in GM started off as clinicians, but we've subsequently moved on to pathway navigators and administrators, band four administrators, etc., who can do that triage, which is through a protocolized format. If patients have a positive MSU, they're investigated off pathway. And the triage step, the primary triage step was MR versus no MR. And what we found, and this the data has kind of uh, validated this over the last four years of practice, is that generally approximately 18 to 20 percent of patients do not require an MR. So some of the worries about everybody having unnecessary MRs doesn't actually come to fruition. So in GM, out of the 50, uh, five and a half thousand, about 1,100 do not need an MR for various reasons, whether that be that they're not suitable for radical therapy or their contraindications to an MRI. Out of that then leaves approximately four and a half thousand patients in our city that end up requiring MR scans. On those MRs, about 1,400 patients have no suspicious areas and therefore the patients can have their pathway closed after review in clinic. And that means approximately 25%, as, as kind of noted in Carolyn's data up to date, do not require a, a biopsy. So about 1,000 patients don't require a biopsy if you go down the straight to test through a formal straight to test route. In those that do need an MR and do have an MR, approximately 3,000 patients out of the 4,500 are found to have suspicious areas. And what we used the straight to test methodology was for A, introducing MR, which I'll speak about just in a few moments, but also at that time, the vast majority of that, if not all patients in GM were having transrectal biopsies. So if any anterior lesions, et cetera, were found, they couldn't really be reached transrectally. So that meant they would have to have a GA for a, a grid or a transperineal grid biopsy. And we worked out that, that came out to just over 500 patients a year requiring a GA day case. So we used the straight to test 
pathway, the NHS recommendation, to A, bring in MR across the system and B, to bring in transperineal local anaesthetic biopsies across the system as well. So we used it for a twofold change of practice. And I know most of the countries now gone down this route, but there's still areas whereby transrectal is still the kind of biopsy method of choice. So with radiology, they weren't overly keen on 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 kind of going down this route to that stage and you know, all things have changed. And in urology, again, most of our colleagues felt they were busy enough and didn't need any changes to the pathway, which made their lives more difficult. But what were the key enablers for the system-wide change? Well, there was initially transformation funding, so three quarters of a million pounds over two to three years. And with that, we put into place pathway navigators who are crucial, um, CNSs in some of the smaller units or across the city to ensure that there are enough people to manage the pathway. We looked at education, so GP events, webinars, urology education events. Um, we also used some of that money to increase our MR capacity from about 2,500 to 4,500 MR scans per annum. So pathway navigator is an absolute key component of the straight to test um, philosophy. So these navigators, usually band three or band four clerical people, they're crucial. They kind of essentially have overall responsibility for managing the pathway. And what the feedback we've had over the last four or five years as as patient as people will across the, the city and the, the country, great patient experience, multiple contact points. Patients are very happy with the three or four or five contacts they have with the pathway navigator throughout the pathway and to educate and train the navigators. They were initially given scripts that they could read from and after once they got used to all the terminology and dealing with patients, they kind of tend to run them um, run solo. They were given dedicated MRI questionnaires so they could assess whether patients were suitable or not suitable for an MR. Um, and they also provided additional help to the CNSs in terms of administrative jobs and also from the CNSs from whom they'd get some uh, some feedback, etc. We also planned a lot of time in education. I think this is very important. So patient education being the first steps of all patients who are referred in would be contacted by the navigators, given prostate pathway information leaflets, which were either emailed or sent to them. They'd also be given information about transperineal biopsies. So patients would have, would know what to expect. They'd know they were going to have an MR scan. They'd know they'd be coming to clinic. And at that clinic, they may very well have a biopsy. So all of that was already embedded in their, in their psyche before they came to clinic. So nothing was a shock. We also spent a quite, quite a bit of time on GP education through multiple GP education events, webinars, etc. at that time. And also for urologists and CNSs. So, you know, urology education events, CNS education events, so that everyone knew what the PIRAD system was, etc., why the pathway would work, what the pitfalls were, etc. Um, and also we ran a lot of collaborative things with our radiologists um, with regards radiology education. So our pathway currently, so if I look at our current hospital, the Salford pathway. So all patients, the pathway navigator picks up the daily um, two-week wait referrals. They nowadays, they, they triage those themselves. And if there's any queries, they'll go to their CNSs. Those patients are then phoned. Questionnaires are run through to make sure they're suitable for an MR scan. Their MR scan is directly booked by a SharePoint system. Their clinic review is booked for three days after that. So Five days after the navigator call, they should have had their MR scan and they will be coming to clinic. And at that clinic, they'll either have, have a transperineal biopsy or they'll be um, discharged or put on surveillance. And currently for our network, so our, our hospital covers an area of about 250,000 patients. We have 10 MR slots, dedicated new patient MR slots a week, five on Wednesday, which means patients are ready to come to clinic on Monday for a biopsy and five on Friday. And those patients come to clinic on Wednesday for their biopsies. And for the MR reports with uh, with our radiology teams, we have a three-day reporting turnaround time, standard reporting templates, um, and clear localization of the abnormal areas. So they're kind of marked with arrows to show those who are doing the biopsies exactly where to look if they're not too sure. So our kind of experience really is that the cancer pathway was evolving at that time, and I think it's still evolving as Carolyn's, uh, Carolyn's talk kind of uh, alludes to. It's been very much evolution, not revolution, and change can be challenging, but nonetheless, it can be implemented across the, uh, across the system as necessary. Okay, I think that's my slides. Thank you. Satish, thanks very much. That's a, a bit of audit and then pathway redesign. I think we're all very uh, jealous and impressed of what you've set up as a team there in uh, in Manchester is 
request to share your slides if that's all right. And I think in the sort of spirit of GERF, the case studies and sharing educational materials would be really useful. I'm sure there's many centres we'd like to try and replicate that. Um, do we have any questions for Satish? I'll just, if there's any in the chat bar, put your hand up if you'd like to ask Satish any uh, questions about their pathway. So, Satish, I'll just start with one while we're thinking and we look through the chat bar. There's, there's been a couple of themed ones here. Who tells you if your MRI is normal? Are you seen by a clinician, so a nurse or a urologist? What's the reassurance? What's the follow-up arrangements? Did, did you want to say something about that? Yeah, so generally when the patients, so we tend to run a dual, dual clinic when the patients come back for transperineal biopsy. So they all come to the same clinic and we have experimented with phoning patients and telling them their biopsy out there, their results or MR, et cetera, is okay. And that works for some, but sometimes with the restriction of time, et cetera, we tend to book them into a clinic anyway. So come back and in that clinic, there, there's the CNSs and, and the clinician doing the biopsy. So they'll be picked up by either or and inform that all is well, um, et cetera, and then given their management plan at that point if, if the MR is entirely normal. So we, we still generally tend to do face-to-face -face for that, but generally clinicians. And as a tissue, the, the patient in there who's got LUTs rather than a high risk of prostate cancer, are you picking them up or are you exclusively sort of excluding or diagnosing prostate cancer? No, so, th so those patients, so I guess the first step, A, they're told they haven't got cancer or haven't got obvious cancer. So that's the first step. And that, that in itself, really, it's a huge relief for many. And then if they do need to go down a general kind of um, obstructive lower urinary tract uh, workup or a LUTs workup, then they're kind of siphoned off. They have all the basic investigations in that clinic and um, in the urology hub, and then they're siphoned off into a general clinic. But they're stepped off the pathway at that point. Okay, thanks, Satish. And then from... Uh, Kanagasabe Sahadevin says, who takes ownership of the results to the MRI, uh, of the MRI, sorry, GPs, very concerned about clinical governance? So we, so very much we have set up prostate teams, which sounds very grand, but that can, that can just be two people, but kind of those clinicians who have sole responsibility for managing the prostate pathway so there will be what one of our clinicians has a specific interest and the two of our cns's have a specific interest so they tend to run the prostate pathway so they tend to see the results pick up the results and then subsequently review the patients generally okay thanks Tish. and then a, a challenging one here from adele is this an ageist uh, approach an ageist approach in terms of Adele, do you want to elaborate on that in terms of, do you think it's, well, it's very clear, more elderly? It's very clear that the elderly people are not going to get an MRI because you consider them to have 15 years uh, life expectancy because of their numerical age, because you haven't even seen them, and you will deny them an MRI. I think it will stand in good. I think that's a really, really fair point, Adele. It's very nice to see after so many years. I guess the the issue is, that, you know, that there are your super fit 75-year-olds and your super unfit 48-year-olds. So there's a bespoke aspect to that. I think in GM, our 75 was relatively empirical. So there's lots of discussions that 75 is 80, and we landed at the, uh, the 75 mark. But, yeah, that's certainly open to challenge. I suspect different networks will have their own upper limit. Caroline, you've got uh, something to say. Yeah, I think in uh, in London, when we were looking at our sort of pan-London COVID approach to prostate cancer, we were very clear that an age cutoff isn't uh, legal, dare I say, in the UK. <laughs> so we don't have age cutoffs, and the the wording in the um, in the GERF document will be fit for radical treatment. Remembering that some men in their early eighties are fit for radical radiotherapy. But it's a sliding scale, and yeah, we, not to use just a, just an age. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, so let's go to to Vivek over in Norwich. Vivek. Oh, thanks, John. Uh, I think just correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, the latest NPCA document actually said that actually the highest number of you know, significant mortality ha happens in the age between 76 and 82. Actually if you are going to prevent death in prostate cancer, and that is the age group to target, 
and actually that is the age group we are not doing mri at least by salford criteria any comments on that caroline can i come back to you initially to follow on yeah so i th- i we we wouldn't exclude people so if a patient is fit and it's a you know question we get in clinic all the time is the patient fit for radical radiotherapy if they're fit for radical radiotherapy then there it's reasonable to do the mri because it will inform the pathway if they're only fit for hormone treatment you can base that on on psa so that that's the approach that um yeah the, the median age of death of, from prostate cancer is 90 so <laughs> we're well taken okay thanks satish john can i just come in come back on that john, so just i don't want to misrepresent misrepresent my hospital so essentially so although it's 75 you know it doesn't mean say these patients don't have an mr scan it just means say they don't go straight to an mr scan so there's quite an important distinction yeah. there so one is you go straight and the first test you have is an mr and then you come to clinic at day five and um, the other the other distinction is yes you may be over the the perceived age cutoff range but if you're seen in clinic etc you can then go ahead and have your mr at that stage and all you've lost is a couple of days in a pathway so it's just, it's just that that was a kind of i guess the rationale at that time bearing in mind this is a 2020 pathway and then things evolve over time so i think um yeah i think you're quite right about the age aspect but it's not we're not saying no we're just saying not immediately that's all yeah thank that's you both. important point isn't it um so let's go to adel Yeah, I think I think the age thing uh, about uh, whether you are a candidate for radical treatment or not, and having to have ten to fifteen years of uh, life expectancy, is only applicable if you have low to intermediate breast cancer. If we're talking about the recent eight, nine, and ten, that will kill you in three years. I think if you have three years um, uh, life expectancy, you can still justifiably have radical treatment to a Thanks, Adele. And of course, these are, are guidance um, rather than hard and fast rules, aren't they, in terms of how you apply them. So I think we do need to bespoke them to individual patients as well. Um, Sonia Ashraf. Yeah, no, thank you. So I just wanted to clarify the straight to MRI that um, who at what stage makes the decision that the patient's fit for say, radical radiotherapy, because the GP just fills in the two-week wait referral, you know, with whatever positives, and then it's a non-clinician and an administrator following the algorithm. So who, at what point, has decided that this patient's fit for radical uh, uh, radiotherapy? Yeah. How, how is that cohort excluded and where? Can I go back to Satish, because it specifically relates to navigators, maybe Satish, a non-clinical member of staff making that assumption. Uh, What's the safety netting in that? So I guess the safety netting is a... Um, is that there's always a clinician on on side. So uh, very rarely will the navigator make a, a completely sole and independent decision about major clinical management steps. This is all about just the initial diagnostic part of the pathway. So if there's any doubt, um, if, there's, if there isn't enough information in the minimum data set, then they will go to a clinician. And sometimes that clinician will then just phone the GP or indeed speak to the patient. So, you know, if you've got someone who's got significant morbid uh, comorbidities, then they may not be suitable. That might be quite obvious over the telephone. If, if uh, and then other patients may may not be quite that obvious. So there is a bespoke aspect. And as John's kind of highlighted, these are very much guidelines. And, and just because they don't, go straight to test and don't have an MR right to the eye. It doesn't mean to say they're not going to have radical radiotherapy after they're seen in clinic. It's just it's just a, a, a kind of rudimentary um, participant or, or differentiator at the first step, that's all. Great, thanks, Satish. Okay, well, we've just got a few minutes left, so I'm going to go across to Kieran, if that's all right. Kieran's just going to sum up and give us his thoughts uh, and, and next steps. Kieran. Okay, thanks, John. Well, we've had three very eloquent exposés, and just turning to Caroline for a moment. Caroline, I think that our plan would be over the next month or two, really, to put the document together and to get it get it out there. Is that is that fair? 
That's right, yeah. So in terms of the process, we agreed we would uh, go back to the Exco Committee after this discussion to have had uh, views from trusts across the country. And then the, um, the there'll be, I think, adding in the EGFR is one that comes to mind, but minor things, and then the document will go out. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Caroline. Uh, and Jonathan, I felt that we really didn't give you enough time in terms of the presentation. And I think... I and perhaps many others would would be interested in hearing more on the subject of um, of PET scanning and wonder whether that might be useful for a further meeting actually to schedule it in for 15, 20 minutes if that would be agreeable. That would be fantastic. Great. Well, I, I think we'll do that. One of the things I posted in the comment box was suggestions for further meetings. We've had over a hundred people on on the meeting, and we're still we're still at ninety nine. I see. Uh, so clearly, you know, prostate cancer has huge traction nationally. And if there are things that you'd like to see covered moving forward, if you get in touch with John, Caroline, and myself, then we'll ensure that that is done, and we'll put another date in in the diary. Um, Satish, I think we've had a really good expose in terms of what it is that's going on in GM. Perhaps the thing you didn't mention is that we have an integrated care, medical care record across GM, which enables us to actually look and see what's happening in with the general practitioner. So we're able to pick up a little bit more of the comorbidities than perhaps is available elsewhere. And that perhaps helps us in terms of our triaging straight to test. But we're very conscious of not, not trying to be a just a, a Dell. Uh, Tim, I'm going to turn to you for uh, for a moment in terms of uh, the honorary urologist among among us this evening and uh, and your thoughts. And if you could for a moment in terms of the the nice guidance, because we do have some challenges in relation to urology and current nice guidance about how we finesse those sorts of issues moving forward. Yeah, I think I think what's been great about this conversation, it's led by clinicians with a lot huge number of clinicians on the on the call, and therefore we've got a very good process to this new pathway. I'd, I wonder if we can get out a bit quicker than a month or two, Caroline, which is uh, would be good, because there's a lot of people out there who are asking for it. I think what we do then is we engage a conversation with Nice, but I don't think it should put us, it should stop us from sending out the new pathway, as it's been developed in a very rigorous process with all the available evidence, and I think Nice will welcome it. So I suggest. It's all agreed. We then have a conversation with Nice, but we'll get it out there anyway because I think clinicians want it. But thanks for everybody's help, Caroline. Thanks for leading it, and um, uh, well done, everybody. It's a great effort. Okay, so it, it just remains for me, thanks, Tim, to to thank uh, thank everybody, in particular our three speakers this evening for the hard work they've put in. And I think based on the success of this, we will get another date in the diary, and we'll set around an agenda at good time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.